Okay, welcome back. Uh, our next speaker is Thomas Wong from Creighton University. So Thomas, all yours. Thank you, yes, I'll be talking about a couple of papers actually on simplifying dynamic quantum walks for quantum gates. Uh, the first paper is joint work with Rebecca Herman, who's also uh, in this workshop. She's at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And the other paper is with one of my master's students who just graduated this past spring, and he's starting a PhD program at the University of Maryland. All right, so I wanna start just by uh, framing what a uh, continuous time quantum walk I'm using, and it's been covered several times already in this workshop, but uh, a, a quantum walk is just a quantum particle that's confined to a graph. So there's a, an example of a graph with four vertices. And the state of the particle is a superposition over these four vertices. So you have some amplitude C naught of being at, at vertex zero, uh, some amplitude C one of being at vertex one and so forth. Um, and we're gonna evolve by Schrodinger's equation with some Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian I'm going to be using throughout this entire talk is the adjacency matrix divided by the norm of the adjacency matrix. Um, whereas, and I think most of the previous talks is just as equaled the adjacency matrix without dividing by the norm. So the reason why I'm doing that is because um, I'm going to be looking at simplifying some of these evolutions. And so the amount of time that evolution takes matters. And by dividing by this, you um, normalize out your time, that way you have a consistent jumping rate on various graphs, or in physics terms, you have a consistent energy usage on different graphs. And so this makes it so that I can compare a quantum walk on one graph very easily to a quantum walk on another graph, just by looking at the, the time evolution. Um, so it's just the adjacency matrix. And uh, that's the adjacency matrix for the graph um, up there. So you have a zero if vertices are not adjacent and a one if they are adjacent. So physically, uh, a Hamiltonian like this can come up in a spin chain with what are called XY interactions. Um, so there's some physical motivation to this kind of Hamiltonian. And we just evolve by Schrodinger's equation. Here's Schrodinger's equation with H bar equal to one. And since the Hamiltonian is time independent, the solution is just uh, the initial state multiplied by e to the minus i a t divided by the norm of the adjacency matrix. Um, so this is very similar to what we've seen in several talks so far, except we're just divided, dividing by the norm. So one of the uses for continuous time quantum walks is in quantum computing. And in fact, it's universal for quantum computing. So we saw yesterday, uh, David Gossett gave a great talk talking about the scattering approach that Andrew Childs proposed. And then David Gossett um, extended to the multi-particle case with collaborators. And so this is just a, a picture from uh, from that original paper. So here we're looking at a couple of two qubit gates. So one of them is a C naught and another gate is a Hadamard acting on one of the qubits. So if you have two qubits, you have four basis states that are uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And so you have a rail for each of these basis states and then you add these little graphs in between and then these graphs will implement different gates as we saw um, from David's talk. So this is one way to implement quantum gates using, uh, using quantum walks. Another approach that is the discontinuous walk that was proposed by Underwood and Fader. And so uh, David Fader is actually part of this conference as well. I saw him um, in the list of participants. So uh, in this proposal, it's similar where you also have a rail encoding. So this is another picture from, this is a picture from their paper. So here, this is a single qubit gate. So if you have a single qubit, you have zero or one. So there's just two rails. If you had two qubits, it'd be four rails. If you had three qubits, it'd be eight rails and so forth. So you have another uh, rail encoding for the states. And then now the graphs here can be weighted. So these mu's are actually different weights. Um, so it's a weighted graph. And then the edges can also change with time. So that's, why they, that's what they mean by a graph that, it, that by a walk that is discontinuous. So here we have a time varying graph um, and it's also a weighted graph. And so they show also that you can implement a universal set of quantum gates. So you can implement any quantum circuit using this type of quantum walk. So these are a couple methods that are over 10 years old now, um, but I wanna focus on a newer method that was proposed just a couple of years ago by Rebecca Herman, who is one of my collaborators and Travis Humble. And they call this a dynamic graph. 
And so here's an example of a dynamic graph. A dynamic graph is just a sequence of graphs. So what you would do on this sequence of graphs is you would evolve on this graph for time three pi over two. Then you'd evolve on this graph for time pi over four. And then you'd evolve on this graph for time three pi over two. And so again, the edges are changing now at uh, discrete times. So you do a continuous time quantum walk here and then you suddenly change your JCNC matrix to this one. You do your, your continuous time quantum walk here and then you suddenly change your JCNC matrix to this graph and then you walk for this amount of time. And so um, what Herman and Humble were able to show is that this can implement the universal set of quantum gates consisting of the Hadamard gate, the T gate and the control knot gate. So basically with these three gates, you can, you can uh, simulate any circuit is idea. So this is universal for quantum computing. Um, they also showed how to implement uh, several other gates nicely, such as the poly gates, the XYZ gates. Um, in the original construction, they actually needed some extra vertices to make some of these gates work. Um, I showed later that you actually don't need those uh, ancillary vertices um, if you include self loops in the graph. So that's why you'll notice that some of the vertices will have self loops. So by removing the ancillary vertices, what we get is that the graph only needs uh, the number of basis states for the number of vertices. So if you have a qubit, that would be two basis states, zero and one. If you had two qubits, you'd have four basis states. If you had three qubits, you had eight basis states. So in this method, you would only need if we call n the num capital N the number of basis states, you only need capital N vertices as opposed to capital N rails. So in the previous two approaches, the scattering approach and the discontinuous walk approach, you needed a bunch of rails. Here, you don't need a bunch of rails. You just need however many vertices you need. Um, so this is better in terms of space, if you want to think of it like that, um, the number of vertices used. But the trade-off is that now your graph is changing with time. So. Um, all right, so let me give you an example of how to implement a quantum gate um, using uh, uh, one of these uh, dynamic quantum walks. So let's start with the Hadamard gate. So the Hadamard gate is a single qubit gate, and when it acts on zero, it gives you a uniform position of zero, superposition of zero and one. And when it acts on one, it gives you another uniform superposition of zero and one, but with a minus sign phase. Um, so this is what the Hadamard gate does. Um, and we can also uh, carry this through into a superposition because it's a linear operator. So if we want to know how H acts on the superposition of zero and one, so you have a qubit that is some combination of zero and one, what we can do is we can just have H act on zero, which gives us this sum, and then H acts on one, which gives us this sum. So if we do that, this is what we get. So this zero turned into this sum of zero and one, and then this one, when acted upon by the Hadamard gate, turned into this difference of zero and one. And now we can just factor and simplify to group together the things that the amplitude of zero and then the amplitude of one. So this is what a Hadamard gate does to a general qubit. Uh, now we're gonna show how to get this exact same result using a quantum walk on a dynamic graph. So, we're actually gonna use this, this exact same graph that I had a couple of slides ago. This, is, this will actually implement a Hadamard gate. So let me show you how this works. So let's, so we need the JCNC matrix of each of these graphs because we're gonna walk with the JCNC matrix. So the Hamiltonian is equal to the JCNC matrix divided by the norm of the JCNC matrix. In this case, all of these norms are one. So it doesn't do anything here, but for more complicated graphs, it, it can come up. So start with a single qubit, that's a superposition of zero and one. And let's go ahead and walk on the first graph for time three pi over two. So we're gonna multiply this state by e to the minus i times the JCNC matrix of that first graph times that time for the first graph. And if you just you know, work out what that matrix is, multiply it, what you find is that this applies a phase of i to the, to the one state. So that's all this does. Um, nothing happens to zero and then one gets multiplied by, by I. Now we're gonna walk on the second graph. So we're gonna use this as JCC matrix A2 um, for time T2. And when we do that, we get this. So what we get is that zero becomes this uniform sum of these two amplitudes. And then one becomes this difference 
except we're off by a minus i here. So we almost have the Hadamard gate except for this minus i. So what we're gonna do in this last, last graph is by walking on this with this self loop is we're gonna apply a phase of i to this. So if we have minus i times i, we get plus one. And so now this is plus one. And you can see that this is the exact same result as the Hadamard gate. So this is precisely the Hadamard gate. So just by walking on this sequence of three graphs, we can implement a Hadamard gate. And the idea is Herman and Humble figured out how to do this on the whole universal gate set, set on Hadamard T and C naught and on poly gates and things like that. And so um, I'm not gonna go over all of those constructions. It's just, you know, you can just look up in the papers what sequence of graphs to use and it's just that. So um, it's really straightforward. So let me give you an example here. I don't know if this zoom menu is in the way. You know, a bit off to the side, to the bottom. Okay, so here is a quantum circuit um, acting on three qubits. And so, if you wanted to implement this using a quantum walk, uh, the just by looking up in you know, Herman and Humboldt's paper or my follow-up paper, uh, you can just write down all the circuits for each of these gates. So the graph you get actually looks like this. So there's 16 vertices, sorry, so there's 16 graphs in this sequence, in this dynamic graph. And since it's three qubits, of course, each graph has eight vertices because you have eight basis states. So uh, the total evolution time, if you add up all of these 16 evolution times is 67 pi over four, which is about 52.6 time units. Um, where each of these come from is these three graphs are this first Hadamard gate acting on that first qubit. Th these next two graphs are this X gate. These next three are this Hadamard gate on this last qubit. Then we have a control knot, which is these two graphs. Then we have a Y gate, which is those two. We have a T gate, which is that one. We have a Z gate, which is that one. And then one more C knot is those two. And again, you're not expected to know where all these come from. Um, it's just, but it's very similar to the Hadamard example I gave you. In. Um, you know, you just look up in the previous papers. How do you do an X gate? Okay, just these two graphs. How do you have a mark gate? These three. How do you do C knots? These two graphs. So it's, it's fairly straightforward to convert a circuit into a quantum walk. All right. So if you look at this graph, um, it's kind of long. You know, it's like 16 vertices. It's kind of complicated. And so a very reasonable question is, is there a way to simplify these dynamic graphs? So instead of having 16 graphs, maybe have fewer graphs or reduce the total runtime. Are there ways that you can combine graphs and do things like that? And so that's what this talk is about. And this is the topic of the two papers I'll be discussing. So the question again is, can we simplify dynamic quantum walks? And yes, that's why I am able to give a talk that we have some results on this. So the first bit paper with Rebecca, um, it's posted on the archive there just this past June. Um, we give uh, a general observation about the uh, periodicity of the graph, um, which can be used to simplify things. And we give specifically six observations that we can use to simplify uh, dynamic quantum walks. And then in this other paper that came out earlier this month uh, with my former master's student, uh, we talked about how to uh, implement single qubit gates and controlled gates very easily. And so I'll be going through um, the results from these two papers. So let's go ahead and start with the paper with Rebecca with that general observation about the periodicity of graphs. So one of the nice things about continuous time quantum walks is that on many graphs, the evolution is periodic. So let me give you a few examples. So if you evolve on this graph, where you have a couple of self loops on these two vertices, if you evolve on this for time two pi, nothing actually happens. So this is equivalent to the identity gate. So basically, if you see a graph like this, um, you can always take the evolution time to be modulo 2 pi, because if you evolve for time 2 pi, it doesn't do anything. Uh, here's another graph. If you evolve on this cycle um, for time 2 pi, you also get the identity. Um, for some of you that are more familiar with the cycle, you might think like, wait, I thought the period was uh, pi, That's, this is because I divided by the norm of the JCC matrix. So the JCC matrix for this graph has norm two. So you have to double the runtime in order to make the, in order to have a fair comparison between all the graphs. So this has a period of two pi as well, and it does nothing, you get the identity. 
And then some graphs like this, uh, this is not periodic. So I put the period is infinite, I guess. Um, so if something like this, you wouldn't be able to take the evolution time modulo some finite number. Um, but fortunately, we don't really worry about cases like this because for all of the quantum gates, I mentioned, you know, you can look up in the previous papers, how do you implement each of these gates? Um, fortunately, only periodic graphs come up. And so this is a very useful tool where, you know, if, again, if you have evolution time, you can always take a modulo the period and that saves you some time. Um, even if you did have graphs like this come up, if you had some more exotic future work, um, many of our observations would still allow you to simplify and combine graphs. You just might not be able to reduce the runtime by taking modulo the of a period. Okay, so this is kind of general observation. Now let's get into our specific observations. Um, so the first one uh, we're gonna look at through, actually the first three, we're gonna look at a running example, which is uh, when you apply the X gate to two qubits. Um, so basically, uh, if you were to, again, look up in previous papers, how do you do this? Well, this, these two gates are the X gate are on the left qubit, on the top qubit. And then these two are the X gate on the other qubit. Okay, so this is what you'd get using previous results. And now in this new work, we're gonna look at how to simplify something like this. Um, this result using previous results, this has a total runtime if you add up all of these of four pi is about 12.6. So the first observation we'll use to uh, move towards simplifying this uh, comes from looking at these two. So if you look at these two graphs, the adjacency matrices of these graphs commute uh, because this adjacency matrix here is, well, I mean, basically just work out what the adjacency matrices are and you find that they commute. And so remember the time evolution operator is the the complex exponential of these adjacency matrices. So if the adjacency matrices commute, that means the time evolution operators also commute, so you can change the order of these graphs. So basically, if you have graphs with commuting adjacency matrices, the graphs commute in this you know, dynamic quantum walk sense. So you can just swap the order. So here, graph two became graph three, and then graph three became graph two. Um, so this in itself doesn't save you any time or any graphs. There's still four graphs here and this runtime's still the same, obviously. But being able to swap the orders of things ends up setting up like all the other observations. So this is actually a very, very useful tool. Um, so again, here, there's no speed up yet, um, but it's, it's very helpful. So let's see how this graph now sets us up for the second observation. So I'm gonna recopy this bottom graph here on the next slide. So this is what we left off with. Um, now I wanna highlight these two graphs. So you notice these two graphs are identical. They're the same graph, right? There's a self loop on all four vertices here. There's a self loop on all four vertices here. And what we can do then is we can combine these two graphs into a single graph. And we, what we can do then is we combine the evolution times and then we can take it mod two pi, which is the period. So if you add these two runtimes, you get a period of, you get a runtime of three pi, but that's equivalent to pi because this is periodic with period two pi. So here now we see an improvement. We see that we've reduced the number of graphs to just three. And using this general observation about the periodicity of graphs, we were able to reduce the runtime now to just two pi. So it's half the time, which is nice. All right, now I'm gonna recopy this graph at the bottom here on the next side. So here's what we just had. We only have three graphs now and the time is just two pi. And we can simplify this um, one more way that we were able to find, which is focusing on these two. So, um, one of the interesting things about this path graph here is that if you evolve by time pi over two, you're actually uh, performing perfect state transfer from one end to the other end. So basically the amplitude at zero, zero moves here with some phase and the amplitude at one zero moves to over here with some phase. And same thing here, right? This is a path graph of two vertices, which has perfect state transfer for time pi over two. So these two amplitudes just swap with some phase. And the same thing happens here. We have perfect state transfer between these two vertices 
and perfect state transfer between these two vertices. So if you follow what happens, the amplitude at zero, zero moves down here to one, zero, and then it moves from one, zero over to one, one. So the net result of these two graphs is just zero, zero goes to one, one. And similarly, the amplitude at one, zero goes to zero, zero, then it goes from zero, zero to zero, one. So the end result is that those amplitudes Goes, the amplitude goes from one zero to zero one with some phase. If you do that for all of them, basically the amplitudes jump across uh, the diagonally. So what you basically get if you combine these perfect state transfers is a single graph that looks like this. So the amplitude goes from zero zero to one one and from one zero to zero one. So you just combine this sequence of perfect state transfers. And then there's some phases that I mentioned. So you have to adjust for the phases. And that's what makes this, oh, let me move that zoom bar. That's what move, that's what causes this runtime to go from pi to three pi over two. It's because we had to adjust for the phases from perfect state transfer. Um, so what we get here is that we've reduced it from three graphs to just two graphs. And the total time is actually still this two pi that, uh, that we had up here. Um, but it's this, but it is still simpler in a way because you have two graphs instead of three in this sequence. So all together, if you combine all three of these observations, the total uh, improvement is that we went from four graphs to two, so we have a fifty so we have fifty percent fewer graphs, and the total speed up is a fifty percent speed up because you went from a time of four pi to two pi. Um, all right, so that's the first three of the six observations. So I'll continue. I look up every now and then because I have the uh, chat pulled up. So I'm just seeing if there's any questions there. Okay, the fourth observation. Um, here's a, a dynamic graph of two graphs. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and the total evolution time of this is just going to be pi, right? Pi over two plus pi over two. And so one of the interesting things here is that you'll notice that graph G2. Um, is a subgraph of the complement of G1. And so basically, if you look here, G2, you see how there's uh, an edge on vertices 1, 0, and 1, 1. If you look over here, 1, 0, and 1, 1 don't have any edges at all or self loops. So that's like what, what, what we mean by this. So what this, what we proved in the paper, and by the way, there's proofs of all of these observations in the paper. I'm not going into any other proofs. Um, what we can do then is we can actually combine these graphs. So we can basically move this edge to here um, like that, and we can get rid of this second graph altogether. So we can combine these two into a single graph. So basically, if you have a graph that's uh, a subgraph of the complement of the first graph, and basically meaning that the vertices with edges here don't have any edges in the first graph, you can, you can actually combine them into a single graph. So here we have half the number of graphs and then the runtime is also halved. So that's also a 50% uh, improvement in both of those quantities. All right, I don't see any questions, so I'll keep going. The fifth observation, uh, this is gonna be uh, a, from the Y gate acting on a qubit and the Z gate acting on a second qubit. And if you use the, prior results, this is what you would get. Um, so the first two graphs are the Y gate, this third graph is the Z gate. And let's see how we can simplify this. So I wanna point out, oh, first of all, the, the total evolution time of this, if you add up all the times, it's just five pi over two, which is about 7.85. And so another observation we have found is that you can move um, what we call loop singletons, which are basically isolated vertices with self loops. So if you look here, this self loop, we can move here if we want. And then this self loop here, we can move over here and then that would extend this evolution time. So basically, so see how these both have an evolution time of pi? So if we move this self loop, we can just move it here and then it evolves for time pi over here instead of evolving for time pi over here. Over here, if we move this self loop over here, then this, self loop at one one needs to evolve for a total time of two pi. So what we would get is this graph. So you see how the net result is that this self loop at one one 
evol instead of evolving by time pi here and time pi here, it just evolves to time two pi here. And we move this evolution for time pi over here. Um, once we have this, you know, we can use the observation that this graph here has period two pi, which means that this graph does nothing at all. So we can just drop that graph. So if we drop that graph, we just get two graphs. And the total evolution time is now three pi over two, which is 4.71. So we've reduced the number of graphs by a third, and this is 40% faster, 40% less evolution time. All right, now let's look at um, the sixth observation. I wanna explore um, Hadamard gates that are applied in parallel. So in this example, I'll just do two Hadamard gates applied. Um, to two separate qubits, although you could have three Hadamard gates, four Hadamard gates, 100 Hadamard gates, doesn't matter. Um, we work it out in our paper. But just for this example, we'll look at two. And so this is what you get if you apply Hadamard gates to both qubits. So if we start with a general two qubit state, so for two qubits, you have four basis states, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and we start, start in some superposition of those four basis states. If you apply the Hadamard gate to both qubits, and then you simplify things, this is what you get. Basically, you get some superposition of all of the, some, so you get a sum here of all of the original amplitudes. Here you get sums and differences of all the original amplitudes, again, some sums and differences and so forth of all the original amplitudes, um, and the minus signs are in different places for each of these. Okay, so this is what the Hadamard gate does when you apply two of them. Now, I want to compare this to uniform mixing on the 2D hypercube in this case, because since it's two Hadamards, it's going to be the 2D hypercube. If you have three Hadamards, it'd be the 3D hypercube, yeah. so forth. Salam, Chajm, Alan, Umadan. Oh, is there a question? So, okay. Thanks, host, for muting that. All right, so let's look at uniform mixing on the two dimensional hypercube, and the 2D hypercube is just a square. <laughs> um, and uniform mixing happens on this at time uh, pi over two. And so if you start with, again, just a general state over these four vertices, if you evolve on this 2D uh, hypercube, the resulting state that you get is this. And what we see here is we get a superposition, a uniform superposition uh, of these four original amplitudes, another uniform superposition of these four original amplitudes, and so forth. Just like we did up here, except we have different phases. And so what you see is that these are very similar. If we can just adjust the phases of these, we can use this to implement parallel Hadamard gates. And in fact, that's exactly what you can do. And so we worked out exactly how to adjust the phases to make this happen. So basically, you evolve with some self loops to adjust phases, then you walk on the hypercube, and then you walk again on a graph with some self loops to apply phases again. And that ends up taking care of all these phases to give you parallel Hadamard gates. So basically, this gives you a much faster way to do Hadamard gates in parallel. Instead of having to do each one sequentially, you just do them all at once. Um, there's a question, uh, so let me take a look at it. From what I can understand is what you are essentially doing, reducing the Hilbert space of the graph by effective Um, I don't think we're reducing the Hilbert space of the graph because the graphs still have the same number of vertices. We're just reducing the number of graphs, but the Hilbert space of each graph is the same. Um, all right. So let me show you uh, what this looks like. So our observation is we can use hypercubes to adjust with some phase adjustments to apply parallel Hadamards. So this is um, two Hadamard gates with the previous result. If you if you implement them uh, sequentially, so the, the first three graphs implement one Hadamard gate, the other three graphs implement the other three Hadamard gates. And let me show you what you get if you use our hypercube thing. Uh, oh, and the, the total runtime of this is uh, 13 pi over two, which is about 20.4. If you use our hypercubes, um, you get this. So basically, we're evolving on some graphs with some self loops in order to fix some fixed phases. And then we walk on the hypercube, on the 2D hypercube, which is a square. 
and then we evolve with some self loops to adjust some phases again. So if you look here, um, there's five graphs. So there's a little bit of an improvement in the number of graphs, but the runtime is actually a lot less. If you add these up, you get five pi over two, which is 7.85. So this is a 62% speed up. It's more than half as fast um, with a modest improvement in the number of graphs. What's nice about this though, is that if you were to have, let's say 10 Hadamard gates in parallel, if you were to implement them uh, sequentially, you'd have three graphs for each Hadamard. So you need 30 graphs to do 10 Hadamards if you just use previous results. If you use our observation, you actually still would just have five graphs. So you do all the phase, phase adjustments here, and then you do a walk on a 10D hypercube, and then you adjust phases again like this. So you'd still just have five graphs um, whereas if you implement Hadamards one at a time, the number of graphs would increase as you add more Hadamards. So the improvement in the number of graphs is actually quite significant as the number of Hadamards goes up. All right, so let's apply all of these observations to um, our motivating example, which was this. So towards the beginning of the talk, we looked at this circuit here on three qubits. And if you just apply the previous results, you get this graph of 16 vertices. And this has time, uh, again, 67 pi over four, which is 52.6. All right, so um, in our paper, we go through like actually, you know, identifying which graphs were pairing up and which graphs were swapping and which self loops were moving and stuff like that. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm not going to go through all that detail here. I'm just going to tell you what we get. What we get after applying our six observations as best as we can is we get this graph, which has 14 uh, graphs instead of 16. So, it's, so there's two fewer graphs, uh, but the runtime is way shorter. So the runtime of this is just 16.5, which is uh, almost 70% faster in terms of the runtime. Um, and then we get a, a modest improvement in the number of graphs as well. All right. Uh, there's a question which is how do you, will you experimentally implement dynamic graphs? Um, it would vary depending on how you're implementing your your uh your like quantum walk. I mean, there's some way that you're encoding your edges in your implementation, and so depending on the implementation, you may be able to change that um, on the fly, or you may not be able to. It depends on how you you might do it. Um, all right. So that's the the first paper I wanted to share with Rebecca. Um, where we have these six observations along with the general observation about the period of graphs. Um, now I want to talk about a second paper, which is work with one of my gra former grad students. Um, what we did is we looked at single qubit gates. So I'm going to motivate this with an example. So let's say we have a single qubit gate, capital U. Um, and capital U is going to be a quantum gate, a unitary, that acts on zero like this. So when it acts on zero, it gives you this wild you know, combination of zero and one. And when it acts on one, it gives you this other combination of zero and one. So this isn't like a nice like Hadamard gate or something, right? There's something a little bit more complicated. Um, and so uh, Look at the chat. Okay, so there's a question, uh, which is, it seems you would have a huge improvement in the runtime if you allowed for weighted self loops. So yes and no. So, I mean, if you go back to, sorry to go back, if you go back to this example here, right? If you have some weighted self loops, you like say this one was weighted, then you might be able to combine these two into a single graph. But remember, if you're allowing weights on the loops, then that's changing your operator norm. It's changing your jumping rate. So in some sense, if you allow for a weighted self loop, um, your walk is now 
using more energy, so to speak. And so that's not a fair comparison anymore. So you'd have to divide that out and then you might end up getting the same runtime as before. So um, yeah, so that, so yeah, the fact that we're dividing by the norm of the JCC matrix kind of levels the playing field with that. Um, but I would guess that there'd probably be some improvements that you could make by looking at some weighted edges because um, you'd be able to like, do some different things that you might not be able to with unweighted edges. But um, overall, that addition, that weighting would have to be divided out in some manner. Good question. All right, back to this. So we're looking at the single cubic gate. That's kind of crazy. And let's look at how we would implement this using prior results. What we do is we'd have to take this unitary and we have to uh, decompose it into our universal gate set, which is H, T, and C naught. And in this case, since it's a, it's a single qubit gate, we only need H and T. We don't need the C naught because the C naught is a two qubit gate. So if you decompose U, U, this single qubit gate into H's and T's, what you get is this. It's H, T, H, T, H, T, H, T, H, T, H, T, which is H, T six times, okay? So now that we've decomposed U into a bunch of H and T's, we know how to implement each H and T using the previous results. Um, so we would now implement each of the gates from our universal set as a dynamic quantum walk. So let me show you what that looks like. So if you apply H, T, H, T, H, T a bunch of times, this is what you would get. It would take 24 graphs. Um, basically, these, this first three, this is H, this is T, this is these three, this is H, this is T, so this basically each row is H T H T H T H T. So you have six rows because it does H T six times. And you see that the total runtime of this is 30 pi, which is 94.25. So this is kind of tedious. And you might imagine that if you're trying to implement other single qubit gates, it's a uh, decomposition might lead to like an even bigger, more complicated graph. That's even worse. And so, um, we want to be able to simplify and implement single qubit gates more efficiently. So one approach is using the previous, is using the results, I just the, the six observations I just talked about in my paper with Rebecca. Um, so if you apply those six observations, you can reduce this by doing the following. So if you look at the first two graphs right there, those are identical graphs. So you can combine them, then you combine the evolution times, and you can take that evolution time mod 2 pi, which is the period for that graph. If you look at graphs G4 through G6, those are also all identical graphs. So we can combine them and combine their evolution times mod 2 pi, which simplifies things. Graphs 8 through 10 are all identical. So we can combine them, divide the evolution time by 2 pi, or take a mod 2 pi. Those three are the same. Those three are the same. Those three are the same. So we do the same combining identical graphs. And what we get by doing that um, are these 13 graphs. So we went from 24 to 13, which is um, almost half. And then the total time here is just 8 pi, which is 25.13. So that's a pretty significant time improvement um, there using, um, the using the observations I just outlined previously. In this new paper with my grad student, IBK, um, he, he was able to do something much better. And what we're able to show is that we can implement that gate um, not with 24 graphs, not with 13 graphs, but with just three graphs. And here's the evolution times. If we add them together, the total time is 367 pi over 100, which is 11.53, which is still faster from what we had before. Um, and this is uh, compared to the 24 graphs, that's almost 88% fewer graphs, and it's almost an 88% speed up in terms of the evolution time. So this is great. We can implement it in just three graphs. And what the great thing about this result is that we can actually implement any single qubit gate with just three graphs. And so for so any single qubit gate can actually be written by, as a rotation around the z-axis, the y-axis, and then the z-axis again of the block sphere by angles lambda, theta, and phi. Um, so I'm going to prove this is like something in like Nielsen and Trong. You can write any single qubit gate in this uh, Z, Y, D, D composition. And so once you do that, um, we can 
implement these using the following dynamic graph. So you have these three angles here. So these three angles just appear in the in how much time you evolve on each graph. Um, and so yeah, basically any single qubit gate can be implemented using these three graphs. And you would just have the correct phases in there. So that's nice. So instead of having to take a single qubit gate, decomposing it into our universal gate set of Hadamard and T's for single qubit gates, and then implementing each Hadamard and T sequentially, and then try to simplify it using the six observations, you can just jump straight to this, these three graphs and be done. Um, so this is a very general result. So basically any single qubit gate is now easy to do with a dynamic quantum walk. We can actually generalize this very straightforwardly to uh, controlled unitaries where the, so basically you have a single qubit gate again, but now it's controlled by any number of qubits. Here I have three qubits total. Um, it looks like this. So if you look at the previous graph, you had a self loop and then a, uh, a P2, a path of length two, and then another self loop. It's the exact same thing, except you just put it on the correct vertices and then the times are the same idea. So basically you decompose a single qubit unitary into so that you get these three angles and then that tells you the times. And to make it controlled, you just stick the edges in the right place. So basically any controlled single qubit unitary um, can also be easily implemented by a quantum walk on a dynamic graph with just three graphs. Take that. Um, and so that means if you have any circuit that consists of single qubit gates and single qubit controlled gates, um, it's very easy to do with a dynamic quantum walk or, or straightforward to write down what all the graphs would be. Um, so let me give you an example of that, of an application. So you can apply this then to uh, the quantum addition circuit. Um, so a little history. So there's different quantum addition algorithms. So, um, but they all basically do something like this. So if you're trying to add two bit strings, A and B, then you, in order to do this in a reversible way, you replace say A with the sum of A plus B. So that way it's a unitary evolution. And there's different circuits to do this. So one way is the, <coughs> this is a quantum version of the classical ripple carry circuit. Um, and Herman and Humble actually, when they proposed uh, dynamic quantum walks, they actually showed how you can implement this ripple carry addition circuit using their construction. What we're gonna look at in our paper that utilizes the single qubit gates and controlled single qubit gates is actually the addition circuit that's based on the quantum Fourier transform that, that, uh, that uh, Draper introduced. So this is what it looks like. So if you wanna add two bit strings, uh, A and B, the circuit looks like this. So this block here sets the initial value. So it sets the values that we wanna add. This part here performs the quantum Fourier transform on A. This adds A and B together. And then this takes the inverse Fourier transform of A resulting in A plus B where we started with A. You don't need to understand how the circuit works. The point is, if you look at this entire circuit, it consists of single qubit gates and controlled single qubit gates, which means we can just go with you each one and be like, we can implement this with you know, directly. We can implement this directly, this directly, this directly, this directly. We can just go through each one and write it down um, as a quantum walk on a dynamic graph. And if you do that, you get this long graph because there's a lot of circuits here um, that I'm going to show you over the next several slides. So here's the first 15 graphs. You're not expected to understand this. I'm just showing you that we did it. Okay. Um, here's the next 15 graphs. So graph 16 through 30. Here are uh, how many more graphs? 12 more graphs. So there's 42 graphs total. Basically you can do it, right? And it's, it's straightforward if you just look at, you know, each graph, each, each gate one at a time. And the total evolution time is, of this is 187, that should be pi over four, which is about 146.87. Um, and we actually simulated this. Uh, so we did, so we wrote down the Jason C matrix of all 42 of these graphs. And we did the time evolution and we plotted it and we showed that this does exactly as you expect that the, uh, um, that the circuit does. So we're able to add using a continuous on quantum walk using this uh, Fourier transform method. Okay, so just to summarize, so 
Uh, Herman and Humboldt show that dynamic quantum walks are universal for quantum computing. Um, so we now have another way of getting universal quantum computing with a, con with a continuous time quantum walk. Um, but the graphs might be long if you wanna decompose it in terms of the universal gates at H, T, and C naught. And so we explore different ways to simplify them. Um, with uh, Rebecca Herman, we uh, had six observations that's in that archive preprint from earlier this summer. And then with my former grad student, IBK, we looked at how to implement any single qubit gate and any single qubit controlled gate using just uh, three graphs. And that's in uh, a preprint that came out earlier this month. Um, so thank you for listening. Thank you for Tom giving an interesting talk. And so any questions? Oh, yeah, so it looks like there's one that just came out in the chat. Um, so the question is basically like, how did we find these, uh, these graphs? How, are these, you know, these, how do you find these methods for speeding things up? Um, we didn't have a systematic way. Basically, we thought about it and you stared at things and then these are these are what we came up with. So I'm, I'm confident that there is lots of room for future research and future improvements along the, these lines. Um, I mean, actually, if, if you look at uh, Rebecca and my paper um, here, we actually end with like some further research and you know, open question type things. And there's an observation that we had that seems like, um, you could have yet another way of simplifying things, but we weren't quite able to, to work it out. And so it's, it, I'm sure there are more ways you can simplify things. And I'm sure that this is not the, the end of, of this line of research. Um, there's another question. Can we represent the cross operators using graphs? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not. Uh, I don't think I've worked with cross operator since I like took a course in quantum computing in grad school. So I, I don't recall them well enough to be able to answer that off the top of my head. So I have a question. Is yeah. there any lower bound or proven lower bounds for the time for a given single cubic gate? Oh, I mean, it, because you keep simplifying and the time is yeah. getting shorter and shorter. So it's how much can we simplify? Yeah, I don't know any known lower bounds. I mean, hmm. yeah, I mean, if you if you're shifting yourself to the continuous time quantum walk, I don't know. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure how far we can reduce it. I mean, I guess it's also kind of. It also depends on what graphs you're allowing yourself, right? Like, for the, like there's a previous question about if you allow yourself to have weighted edges, um, like that, that might allow you to do certain things differently and maybe faster um, than if you just have um, unweighted edges. There's another question, um, which is, is there any cost to changing the graph? Um, no, we're not. We're not accounting for that. We're just taking the time on each graph that like T1, T2, T3, T4, you know, underneath each graph, and we're just adding them up for the for the total time. Um, I, I guess in reality, it takes some time to like tune down to like remove edges and then to ramp up your new edges, or to do that like simultaneously, right? Right? Like you ramp down your old edges and up the new edges. Um, and so yeah, we're not we're not worrying about that. That sounds it sounds like an important consideration if you want to implement these, but that's kind of more than we've considered at this point. So Alistair says, <coughs> eleven and three of them should give a lower bound for the gate time. Oh yeah, um, so that's kind of in response to, to I think your question, Sam. Um, that you should be able to get a lower bound there. That's like a, 
I remember that's a long time since I looked at that. Something about like the maximum speed or rate at which you can transform quantum systems, something like that. So um, sounds like there, there's an application to that here. Oh, are there any other questions? If there's no questions, let's thank Tom again. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you.